earlier in the week that he had a funeral to come up. And so I was glad to step in and to be back at Faith in Crisis. I'm so happy to be here tonight with all of our guests. And so let me lead us in prayer, tell you what's coming up in the next few days, and then we'll be ready to jump right in it. Our Father and our God, we are excited to tell you that we love you, to tell you that we lift you, to tell you that there's none like you anywhere. We thank you, God, for sparing us another day. We pray for all of those who are sick all over our land and country, not just here in America, but all over the world. I pray, God, that your healing balm, that you would heal those who are in hospitals. And then, God, I pray for all the families of those who've lost a loved one. I pray that you would comfort them and wipe the tears from their eyes. And then all of us who have not been affected by the virus, we sing a song of gratitude and praise, and we tell you thank you. I ask that you would keep your hedge of protection around us. I pray for our mayor, our governor, our president. I pray, God, that you would give them wisdom and knowledge to lead us through. We pray for all of the first responders, the policemen, the firemen, the doctors, the nurses, and we pray, God, that you would protect them and their families. Keep us now in your care, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Listen, tonight you better be ready to get to Facebook and to ask some questions because we have some dynamic guests with us tonight. Let me try to say real quick, as long as my mind can retain it, that on Monday night, I will be hosting on Monday night, and we will be talking about the pressures of being in the house, the pressures and what can happen and what can we do to alleviate some of those pressures. And we will have with us Love McPherson. She will be back with us. And we will have uh, Fiona Arthurs, who is a tremendous family counselor. And then the love doctor, Dr. James Ford, will be with us. So you don't want to miss Monday. And then Tuesday night, I don't even know how we're going to handle Tuesday night. The stage isn't big enough for the four personalities who will be here with me Tuesday night. Tuesday night, uh, Melody Span Cooper will be back with us, and she's going to host. Many of you have been asking, could Melody come back? She's going to come back. And our two guests will be Roland Martin and Al Sharpton. And how can a stage whole Roland Martin and Al Sharpton, and we're going to be talking about uh, this virus and what can be done about it. But tonight, I am so excited tonight because tonight we have some very special guests. Here with me tonight is Dr. Damon Arnold, who is the former uh, head doctor here in the state of Illinois. And Dr. Arnold, we welcome you. We're glad to have you here. And then we have Dr. Terry Mason, back with us tonight. This brother is so full of information, and so I cannot wait to hear from them. Uh, you get a chance to start getting your questions ready right now. This, this program is going to be Ask the Doctor, and so whatever you need to know, we have two of the most well-informed doctors here with us. But tonight, I wanted to start out talking about the fact that this is not the first time our country has ever seen a pandemic before. It's not the first time our world has seen a pandemic before. And you know, uh, Dr. Arnold, one of the things they say is that uh, those who don't know their history are bound to repeat it. And so I wanted to start out talking about history so that we don't repeat it. I've asked uh, Ron Grossman, who is a tremendous professor of history, and he is a writer for the Chicago Tribune, to join us tonight, and he's going to talk about the history of pandemics, because we know that we have a knowledge of pandemics that we have had before in our country. And so I wanted to ease your mind by letting you know that our country has been here before, we came through it, and we're going to come through this one. So Dr. Grossman, welcome so much. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for uh, agreeing. You took my call, and you agreed to come on tonight. And we know you as a foremost authority in history, and especially the history of pandemics. So welcome. And why don't you explain to our viewing audience uh, how we've been here before and what's sort of the rundown of the history of pandemics? Let me start on a personal note. My parents were children at the time of the 1918 pandemic. 
and they lived to be just short of 90 years old. And that was the one event of their life that they could not exercise from their minds. Periodically, they would talk about it. Now, when you think of everything that they went through, uh, just before that had been the World War, World War I, and uh, their, they, they were, their fam our family were recent immigrants, so they had to be worried about the aunts and uncles back in Europe getting caught between the fighting. Then came the Depression of the 1930s, and then came World War II, and of all those events, it was what they went through when people were dying in Chicago because of that influenza uh, epidemic. They remembered very vigorously that the state of medicine wasn't quite scientific at that time. So they had to wear a little clove of garlic around their neck because either a doctor or someone said that's the way to survive it. Wow. Um, you know, we have to be careful with someone saying that that's the way to survive a pandemic because if not we might have people running around drinking bleach thinking that yeah. that's the way to survive a pandemic or or you wouldn't be able to find garlic at the supermarket tomorrow a absolutely so what give me before we deal with 1918 explain or describe to our audience some pandemics before the 1918 pandemic the first one that we have good information about occurred in the 5th century B.C. when Athens and Sparta were fighting what turned out to be the kind of world war of antiquity. And it was kind of a draw because Athens was a sea power and uh, Sparta was a land power. So nobody could win the war because the one had a, na a navy but no army. The other had an army but no navy. Mm. And then a plague hit Athens. Athens had surrounded itself by a wall. The, the, the pandemic didn't know anything about stopping at walls. And it so weakened the, the Athenian population that a few years later, Sparta won that battle. That's the first but hardly the only time that the pandemics have influenced Western history. There were several in the Roman Empire, uh, yeah, 100 years apart. And in the Middle Ages, probably the worst of all, the Black Death hit Europe in the 14th century. Now, listen carefully to the number. It is estimated that in the 15th century, uh, I'm sorry, the 14th century, the deaths due to the Black Death, the bubonic plague we think it was, were 30 to 40 percent of the population. Now, in order to get a grip on that, what that means, look around you at all the labor-saving devices in your house, the toaster, the oven, the car outside. None of those existed. If anything was moved, turned, or done in that age, it was done through the muscle power of a human being or an animal. You've wiped up maybe 40 percent of that. And then when it, people thought it was all over, it came back again and again, and it was still coming back in the age of Shakespeare. They can date Shakespeare's plays as this was the year that the theater wasn't performing, so he sat down and wrote a script for next year. Wow, it's almost like the football season. The football season wasn't in. Okay, so can I ask you this? It seems like every 100 years, the world is faced with a plague. Is, is it true to say that? Roughly so, yes, roughly so. Sir. Wow. And uh, rarely are they a single occurrence. It, it, it's, uh, it takes place, then it seems to ease, ease off, and then it comes back again. And wow. it's that second wave that's demoralizing. You can imagine uh, if you've lived through it, and then suddenly it's okay, and it comes back again. That's got to be a tremendously just demoralizing uh, effect. And I want to talk about the second wave in just a minute. So the most famous uh, plague, and it seems like the virus that we have the most history on, is the virus of 1918. And so those of you who are watching, I'm trying to explain that we've been here before. And we have to learn from our past so that we will not repeat it. And so... 
Tell us about 1918. What happened? What were the people doing at that time? And where, where did the virus come from? Let's talk about 1918. Okay. Uh, in 1918, uh, it was first written about. Didn't mean it began there, but it was first written about in Europe. And it was in the middle of a war that pitted roughly England and France and Russia against Germany and Austria. And uh, combatants don't like to give out casualty figures, so they suppressed the news of it. Spain was neutral, and so reporters could say these many people they died yesterday at Madrid. So the thing was labeled as the Spanish flu, almost as uh, like this what was almost labeled the Chinese flu before doctors said, wait, that's really not fair. It, we don't know if it began there and came to the United States or was in the United States and went to Europe. We do know that the first appearance in the United States was in Kansas, possibly because Fort Leonard Wood was there and soldiers were in training to go to Europe. Now, whether they brought it with them or brought it back, that's something that scholars debate in the footnotes odd on infinitum. But one thing is sure, that the losses, the casualties, were, were enormous. It's estimated that perhaps a half of the world's population got the flu at that time. They didn't all die, but just think of that. Half of the world's population and 500 million died. In Chicago alone, 10,000 died. The progress here was that it was first spotted up at... Uh, the army bases on the North Shore at Fort Sheridan and uh, Great Lakes. From there, it spread down the suburb. Just think of it. Highland Park, Skokie, Evanston, and Chicago. Uh, and uh, again, at first, people tried to say, even people in charge, well, it'll go away. But it didn't. It got worse and worse. And in fact, when it went away for a short period of time, this would have been uh, from the summer to early fall. It came back with renewed strength. In all, something just short of 10,000 Chicagoans died. Uh, the attempts to deal with it were roughly what we have now. People wore face masks. Uh, the authorities said, let's not have gatherings in, in public places. But you couldn't pull them all out. For one thing, a lot of people didn't have, uh, rest, didn't have kitchens to cook. You couldn't close uh, the restaurant. So there were still places where people congregated. Uh, and uh, then it went away and then it came back the third year, third time, the beginning of next year. But that time it was smaller than the two times before. Wow. So those of you who are watching, I want you to hit the share button. Hit the share button tonight, if no other night because I want everybody to get this information. If we know history, then we won't repeat history. And so I want you to get this information. And so uh, it sounds like uh, what you're saying is that we had a flu or a virus in 1918, and people thought it went away, but it didn't go away. So explain to me the, about the second wave, because right now people are thinking, okay, then May, June 1st, we'll be able to go outside and we'll be able to hang out. Do you think another wave of this virus is likely, and I know you're not a doctor, but just judging from history, do you think that likely another wave of this virus is going to come back? Actually, I am a doctor of medieval oh. history, which I can't write prescriptions, but I can look, look to the past. Yeah, yeah, almost invariably come back. they come back. The big question is, does it come back more powerful or less powerful? Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be a clear pattern there or way that I know to predict it. What happens is that um, the virus is mutating. It's a little bit of DNA, that, that stuff in our, in our cells that tells us of what we are and all of that. Uh, and it's very fast to mutate. On the other hand, as an infection goes around, people who survive generally develop some kind of immunity to it. So it's like a contest, almost like a volleyball contest with the ball going across and back and forth the net between the body producing antibodies for it 
and the virus producing strains that the antibody as bodies aren't equipped with before. Wow. So uh, people who are watching tonight should really know that this is probably the beginning. And I'm going to talk to Dr. Mason and Dr. Arnold about that in a minute. But this is not the end. This is probably just the beginning. Would, would you think so, Dr. The Grossman? Oh, me? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm not used to be calling doctor. Well, since you said you was a doctor, I, <laughs> oh, yes, then I yes, just yes. thought to myself, it's all doctors here tonight. You're a doctor of history. We have these two medical doctors here, and I'm a doctor of spirituality. So we have all of these doctors here tonight. So, Mr. Grossman. It, it's it's got to come back. There's, a, there's almost no doubt about that. The only question is, will it be more virulent or less virulent? And how prepared will we be in two senses? One is, how prepared will we be to do what we're doing now, to take protective measures like wearing a mask outside, not having congregations in large numbers, and psychologically? Are we prepared to take that second body blow and then say, okay, but we're going to get through this? Well, I really appreciate you being on tonight. You have really enlightened uh, those who are watching tonight. I know everybody appreciates you being on. Any closing remarks, anything in the end that I didn't ask you that you think that we should all know about this virus, what has happened in the past, or what are we thinking, predicting in the future? If you need uh, uh, something to keep your spirits up, just recall what I said. In the 5th century B.C., there was a plague in Athens, and then there were plagues in the Roman Empire, and then the really terrible bubonic plague of the Middle Ages, but we're still here. Human beings are strong, and we have the capacity to adapt to problems like this. It's not necessarily going to be fun. It could be painful, but there's no doubt that we will get through it one way or another. And, and Dr. Uh, Grossman, thanks to you tonight, every store in Chicago will sell out of garlic in the morning. <laughs> thanks so much for being with us. It was a pleasure. All Better right, times. Everybody take care. All right, now. God bless you. Thank you. You still have time to hit that share button because I am here tonight with Dr. Uh, Terry Mason and Dr. Damon Arnold. We are here talking about uh, crisis in faith. And so I want to start out with either one of you all. When we say the coronavirus, what is a virus or what is the coronavirus? Well, I think we'll both share, share that answer. <clears throat> One of the things we should know, there's a difference between a virus and a bacteria. A bacteria is usually able to reproduce itself. But the virus, it's, the virus needs a host. It, it, it doesn't have the machinery. So it has to hijack a cell and use that cell's machinery to reproduce itself. And so, okay, and so... What happens is, is that as that happens and, and that virus takes over another cell, it reproduces itself and then that cell explodes with more virus particles that go and do the same thing over and over again. And then these virus part, what these viruses do is they attack and destroy some of our cells. And in this, in this particular virus, it seems to have a predilection for the cells in our lungs, which is what most of these, new, these, these, these viruses that cause pneumonia, that's what they do. This one happens to be very, very dangerous in the way that it does it. And it does it in such a way that it changes so much of the normal activity of our air cells, the ones in our lung, that our lungs then not, don't function well. How, how do we pick the virus? Now, those of you who are watching and you are not deep, you are not smart, and what he just said goes over your head, don't worry about it because you have me sitting here as an interpreter uh, in idiot school, and I'm going to make sure that you understand what he just said. How does this get into our body? Where, okay. where, where does it, how do we pick it up? Well, what happens is when, when somebody has a virus and it's, re it's re you know, it's made a lot of copies of itself and it affects the lungs, so, you know, there's fluid in the lungs right. that uh, then gets made because the lung doesn't like these, 
viruses in it. So when you cough or you sneeze, then it grabs a ride on some of those mucus droplets that come out when you sneeze, and it goes out in the air. And if you happen to be walking by or in the area, because depending on where you are, you, when you sneeze, you could sneeze out stuff that goes out 14 feet ahead of you. Right. And if there's wind or some air blowing, it could take it even further. And if it, the wind pushes it to the right or to the left, then it can infect anybody who happens to be walking around who's breathing, which we all are, right. and just takes those things into our lungs. And this starts the whole thing over and over and over and over so again. So per a person's infected, they cough, they sneeze, we take it in. How helpful is the mask, okay? So a person just sneezed, they have the virus, it's in the air, but I have on a mask. They're not far from me, but I have on a mask. How helpful is the mask? It's helpful if it's on tight, if it's fitting right, if, it, if you just got it half on and there's a big space on this side or at the top because you got it down off your nose, this stuff can go in your nose, it can go in your throat. So you have to make sure that when you're, when you're wearing the mask that you have it on properly. Now, have you heard of different kinds of masks? Like this, the, the mask that I have is there's a, a mask that gets rid of about 95% of the things that are in the atmosphere. And hopefully those holes in that mask, which allow air to come in so you can breathe, are not too big to let the virus particles come in. And so what happens, you hear about N95. N95, but the only way to really use an N95 properly is you have to be fitted so that all of the or area around your nose and your mouth are underneath and that mask is fitting tightly so no air gets in around, under, or between. So those of you who are wearing scarves, it's not just a scarf to look cute. It's a scarf to really cover yourself up and to put it on tight. Uh, Dr. Arnold, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate you. We appreciate all the work you've done for our state. Uh, is that your general assessment of what a virus is, everything that Terry just said, you want to add oh, to it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think Terry is uh, dead on with his uh, description of the virus and how it actually invades our body. Um, and it's an RNA virus. We have DNA uh, that's in our cells, and RNA is another type of genetic material that the virus uses to mu multiply itself. And that, that virus, um, actually, one of the comments that was made earlier um, was that the virus uh, can mutate. But what we're finding right now is that there are about six major strains of that virus circulating. There are two in particular, one that's very weak and one that's very strong. Uh, but what we call that is, is if you have a boat and it's in the ocean, it can drift over time as the waves hit it. Yeah. But uh, that, that is a, called a genetic drift where the virus changes slowly over time. That's how we think the virus is going right now which is good for us. Uh, may, uh, if you had a, uh, a genetic shift where that boat picks up out the water and th it's thrown across the ocean and yeah. it lands somewhere else, it can be a different type of virus that is more dangerous. So as our body is developing the immunity, the antibodies that we have, the proteins in our blood that attach the a virus and hold it and get rid of it, then uh, we are safer. So. We feel that we have enough immunity uh, to cross over those different types of viruses that are coming up, the different varieties of it. <clears throat> but we don't know whether this antibody right now is strong enough to protect us long term. So right now we don't know when, once you've had the COVID, you know, once you've had the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID, which is coronavirus disease, uh, people are mixing those terms up. You don't catch COVID, you develop COVID as a disease. Mm -hmm. And the virus is SARS-CoV-2 that you can actually inhale, as Dr. Mason was saying. So you said it's not a DNA, it's an RNA. It's an RNA, yes. Wow, 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 wow. Dr. Mason, the, uh, okay, let me say this. Should we get tested? Here's a, here's a question I want, and I don't want those of you who are watching to think that your questions are going to go unnoticed. Should we all get tested for corona? And can someone who had the virus be infected again? Well, to Dr. Arnold's point, that's the, the whole point. Right now, the reason why the coronavirus is so, so problematic 
is because it's not a virus we've seen, the body has seen before. Mm -hmm. And so we've never made an antibody, something to fight that virus. So now that it has been seen, and our immune system has seen it, it is done as Dr. Arnold has pointed out, it's now developed a mechanism to fight that particular virus, which is why they're new, now doing another test looking for evidence of how much and how, pow how potent this antibody is going to be toward trying to fight this particular virus if it should come back again. So the, the, the jury, I don't think, is totally in yet as to whether or not if you had this before, you couldn't, cannot absolutely get it again. We don't know, but that's what we're trying to find out. All right, so you hear that. Those of you who keep asking that question, we don't know. The jury is out. You can possibly catch it again. Uh, can someone be out of quarantine 14 days after they start showing symptoms or 14 days after they're done displaying symptoms? I hope y'all got that. I didn't. But yeah, yeah, the, you, yeah. you got it? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, actually, you know, they're saying 14 days is the quarantine period, that which means that you are uh, keeping yourself away from everybody else and stopping you from giving the virus to somebody else. So that's what quarantine is about. Uh, but what they found is that um, after 14 days, the virus can still persist in your body. They're finding more and more evidence that it can go to 21 days and go even further than that. Uh, but the transmissibility of it, as Dr. Mason was mentioning, is mostly by droplets, mostly by air. You, so to talking to a person too closely, that kind of thing, you can actually get it that way. Uh, but the transmissibility of it from um, uh, other bodily fluids, uh, those kinds of things, has not been uh, as great a threat as people, th uh, you know, from the viewpoint of vir virology, mm -hmm. it has not been as much of a mode of transmission. It's mostly the droplets and people congregating and talking to each other. If a person has had the virus and they were in quarantine 14 mm -hmm. days, yes. and then after their 14 days they come out, mm -hmm. can they still infect somebody else? Okay, that the jury's out on it totally, but the likelihood is much less because it's, the, the major, major mechanism of doing it is by coughing Right. So if you don't have your cough anymore, you don't feel sick, you're not expressing fluids, it's going to be decreased, you know, a much decreased likelihood that you're going to be able to spread this virus. Uh, but it's still always an outside chance that you are still infectious. So as we're going through this, what we have to assume, and I think it's a good assumption, is to make assumption that everyone is infected. And then to protect not just yourself, but by wearing a mask, you're protecting other people around you, especially people who are more vulnerable. So if you sit down next to someone who is 60 years or older like me, uh, <laughs> or if you um, sit down next to somebody who has cancer, who has, who's immunocompromised, uh, they have their immune system is uh, decreased, like with diabetes, people with high blood pressure, people who have uh, cancer, uh, people who have uh, lupus, we hear about that all the time. Those people who are more vulnerable to this, uh, those are the people that will suffer the greatest consequences of this. Mm -hmm. So the people that we see who are passing away are people who have some underlying medical condition most of the time. It can happen in young people. We're still trying to figure that out. Why is it happening in someone who's young? But most of the deaths have occurred in people who are 60 years old or older. Mm -hmm. Terry? Yeah, I, I just would add to that that the viruses don't read the book. Huh. Mm -hmm. And they don't read the paper. They don't read, they're, they're not following any instruction that we can give them. Mm -hmm. But the other point that I did want to make that Dr. Arnold uh, talked about mm -hmm. is that what we're learning as we're going. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're going to get more information as we go, as we learn more about this particular virus. The other thing, which I think was what you might be getting to, is why did this seem to impact black people more? Or at least it's reported that it does that. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that, that it's not because there's something inherently or genetically wrong with black people. Mm -hmm. But what is wrong is this has exposed a lot of societal issues that create a condition where black people have had to unduly suffer from things like diabetes, from things like uh, heart attacks or strokes, 
uh, because of the environment that we've grown up. Let me just give you a quick example. If you live in Streeterville, your likelihood to live to be 90 years old is very good. But you get on the train and ride to Inglewood, your life expectancy will drop 30 years just because of where you live. And what does that mean? That means the access to the kinds of uh, grocery stores that may sell good fruits and vegetables, the ability to easily get to a, a quality medical facility, the likelihood that there are not as many environmental toxins, things that are coming percolating up out of the ground, and, because you don't know what's underneath these uh, where we live oftentimes. So what we're seeing is more of a failure of what society, we came, when we came up from the South, we were packed up in tenements. And when we ended up going to these concrete jungles called projects, all of these things set in, in motion a whole lot of things that create an opportunity for these kinds of diseases that we just talked about thriving. Because we grew up, you know, may have come from the South eating greens and beans, but now we have eating more fried chicken wings and we're eating all this other stuff that aggravate these conditions or create conditions within our bodies that cause these things to happen. Now, you know, this is basically where I want to spend a whole lot of time because it, it, it sounds like to me, doctor and doctor, that black people are being punished or lectured to as if the coronavirus, us dying from the coronavirus is somehow our fault. And we're acting like white people don't eat chicken wings. We're acting like white people don't have lupus. We're acting like white people are not obese. We're acting like white people don't have high blood pressure. All of the symptoms that African Americans have, all of the uh, uh, underlying health issues, everybody else got them too. Mm -hmm. Everybody else got the un underlying issues. But why is it that we are dying and then when we die, we say, well, they died because they're obese and because they have high blood pressure. But the obese white people with high blood pressure, they're not dying. It's, it's something they're that dying. It's, it's something that doesn't seem right in the black community. But they are dying. They are. They are dying. Mm -hmm. We're dying more. But we died more already before there was a coronavirus. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, you we know, were dying more we before were dying. the coronavirus. Before yes. the coronavirus, we st the, the, the data on diabetes. But you got to understand that it's not somebody's fault where the, where the communities they live aren't what they need them to be. I mean, it's like our schools. Right. right. Okay? It's not that black children are any less intelligent than white children, but you have to have the right academic environment for those children to properly flourish. All I'm saying is that the communities that we live in, and there's a study that was done about 15 years looking at people in Oakland, California, and when they corrected for the environmental hazards, the lack of the right places to get uh, food, you know, you can't go to a corner store and get greens. You right. can't go right. to a lot of those places don't have them. And so what happens is people do the best they can in the environments they have. They're working min a lower wage jobs, they're trying to do everything they can do to survive as best they can. And we're still dealing with the impacts of racism, or what I call the implementation of the global white supremacy strategy. So we're dealing with things above and beyond what others are dealing with. And so these things are creating environments that make these things have a higher impact on us. Not because that we're, it's about our black skin, but because what our black skin has meant in America. Damon? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with everything Dr. Mason said. And one, one of the things that I've been looking at is that we have a tendency to look at uh, the topography or the maps in, in a still frame. So if I, if I took a picture, you know, one uh, picture out of a movie, right, and a Denzel Washington movie, and I showed you that picture, and then I came back and asked you, what was the whole movie about? You would look at me like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So what we have a tendency to do is to look at a map and say, today, this is how many deaths we've had. This is where the virus is. But what we don't look at is what has been going on before this virus came here and how did it spread? So we don't look at the population density that happens in the city. So if you live in an African-American community right now, Latino community, highly densely packed, because you don't have much space, you don't have much room. 
But if you go out into the suburbs, you are already with social distancing. You are already with stay at home because you have an acre of land around your house. So the people who are in the population dense areas, even if you uh, commute and you go to work downtown and then you go back out of the city, you are still going into a less densely populated area. We stay in that area. And everything we do is around communalism, about getting together, going to the store together, sitting in a restaurant together, going to a function together, going to church together. We are always in a highly populated area. And so this virus loves that. It spreads from person to person. So the closer you are, the more densely you're packed, the more likely it is that that virus will spread. Now, Af African Americans, that is an explanation that I've heard now that it's clear uh, and it is something understandable and it is at least a theory for us to study. And that is Dr. Damon Arnold just said that it could be that African Americans are getting the virus at a higher rate and dying at a higher rate. It could be because of the density of the areas in which we're living in and we live, we live close together. There are other populations of people who don't live as close together. The, su the suburbs are allegedly more spread out than the city is, mm -hmm. which, which is probably why New York City mm -hmm. uh, was yes. hit the hardest of all cities in America because all of the people were compacted no doubt. right on top of each other. No doubt. No as doubt. well as China. <laughs> and China. And China. Yeah. And Italy. Because so, those, those places are people. all compacted upon each other. Right. What, what, well, then, what about the argument for those who don't live in densely populated areas when they say to the governor, uh, restrict, uh, let, let us out, don't make us stay in? Uh, do you buy that argument, or, or do you think they should be in the same boat that we're in? Uh, they're, they're in the same boat because well, they want to go to the mall and they want to go to a highly densely packed area. So in order to uh, forestall that and to decrease the amount of spread from person to person, you have to maintain social distancing. That's one of the only tools we have in our armamentarium to fight this thing. We don't have, as Dr. Mason was mentioning, we want to get a vaccine. We, we're looking at things uh, like mythical drugs like hydroxychloroquine. At this point, we know it doesn't really have a uh, positive effect. As a matter of fact, it may be uh, killing people because of cardiac arrhythmias and those kinds of things. So we have to be careful about who we listen to. The most important things are listening to people who are public health officials. They say one of the major things you need to do is social distancing and making sure that you wear, you know, wear yourself personal protective equipment and making sure you stay away from this virus. The virus has no boundaries. It doesn't recognize race. It doesn't recognize ethnicity. It doesn't recognize how rich or poor you are. Every human being right now in this country is susceptible to this virus. We have not been exposed to it before. We have no natural immunity to it. Before I ask you another question about the virus, let me ask you a question about the President of the United States. Uh, I believe in authority. I'm a, I'm a man under authority. Yes. I, I accept the authority of the governor. I accept the authority of the mayor and the, the police chief. I accept the authority of the stewardess when I get on the plane. You have to have authority. But it's very dangerous, I think, when a non-medical person mm -hmm. starts giving out uh, medical advice and when you start telling people that they can use a household disinfectant like bleach, mm -hmm. and you can kill the germ that's in you. And that, that was such a dangerous statement yes. until Lysol had to come out and everybody had to say, no, don't ingest our product, don't right. drink right. our product. Right. And then there was the pill that you just mentioned that yeah. the pre Hydro hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine yeah. that yes. the president was pushing. How dangerous is it that the president of the United States is giving medical advice in his daily press briefing. Immensely dangerous. <laughs> Immensely. And, and one, one of the things is that you were talking about authority. So, you know, I, I was in the military, you know, for 26 years, and we took an oath to defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Yeah. And 
what we what we were fighting for was the people, and what the Constitution itself says, and what the four you know, founders of this country said, was that you have to be careful about putting someone to power who becomes tyrannical, who actually uh, oversteps their authority and becomes a dictator. George Washington was asked and conjoled to try to go into a third term, right? He said, no. He said, I'm not a king. I am not a, I am not a person that is supposed to be leading this country right now. You need someone else. So when you have someone who is making statements, I know more than the generals. I know more than the, the healthcare yeah. professionals. I know more than the emergency managers. I know more than anyone else. The, the people who are doing the books and know all of the things about the finances of this country, it is extremely dangerous. You start becoming an enemy of the state. The only other, th you know, th I thought about when I saw the Lysol commercial, I thought about uh, going with Himmler. I thought about, uh, you know, the people who were in Nazi Germany doing uncontrolled experiments, Mengele, where they would just say, oh, we're going to try to use this thing on this person without any scientific basis, no um, institutional re no review board, review. nothing, uh, no review, no experts sitting around the table, and I'm going to tell you to take this stuff. I think, I think it's so dangerous. It actually has probably done more damage than good uh, by getting people to have an idea that there's something out there that can help you that is totally false. It's a lie. So people, please do not take medical advice from the President of the United States. Take okay. the medical advice from the medical professionals. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've noticed that we haven't seen Dr. Falsey in a week, uh, the person who was giving the medical advice. It almost seemed like we should have two briefings. We should have uh, a medical briefing yeah. so that the medical professionals can tell us what to do as a country. And then we should have the, the president's hour that he gets to stand and, and rant about whatever he wants to. But it's very dangerous to take that kind of advice. Another caller wants to know uh, how long can the virus uh, stay in your body? Can, does it leave after 14 days? Or is it like uh, HIV, I think that is, can it just lie dormant and, um, and still linger in the body? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that when we sent out, when the state sent out guidance to the funeral directors, mm -hmm. people who had to embalm the decedents, mm -hmm. uh, they, they still had to maintain the same precaution they would use for any other kind of agent that would be found in the blood. How long after someone has died that, that would be there? I don't know the answer to that question. You know, when the first, uh, when the uh, 1918 flu happened and in a remote village in Alaska, uh, of the 82 adults, uh, 75 of them died and they buried them in a mass grave. And in 1951, they went back and dug those graves up and found that virus still alive in, inside of a lady. That's how they tested it to know about what that flu was all about. So it lived, it, it was frozen in the ground. Those bodies were buried. They found a mass grave. And when they found the bodies, that uh, virus was still alive in some of those people. Yeah, and uh, you know, we, we have uh, bacteria that are living in our body right now. And we have viruses in our body. We have uh, viruses like, um, you know, the herpes virus, uh, and that we call it kissing disease, herpes one and herpes two. But a, a, a very large percent of the population actually have that herpes virus that gets reactivated and they have fever blisters and that yeah. kind of thing. So it doesn't mean that we can't live with something being in our body, but it's just that this virus, unless we develop some form of immunity and are able to fight against it, and recover from it. It, 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 when you first get it, it has the potential for killing you. You have the, you know, the, uh, the risk of dying. And one thing to keep up in mind is that 80% of the people who get this sick, uh, virus um, ha are asymptomatic or have very little symptoms. Right. And they'll, come, they'll recover and they feel fine after that. It's the 20% where out of that 20% remaining where they get the very, you know, severe symptoms, they get the fever, they get the cough, the dry cough, that they can progress to a wet cough where you start coughing things out. 
and then you get the muscle aches and pains in your body. Uh, those are the people that are at higher risk for actually going to need a ventilator. So if you walk into the emergency department and you feel sick and you have all these symptoms and they do uh, a check on your oxygen level, they'll put you on like a, 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 a nasal cannula, this little breathing tube, yeah. and it's about two liters of oxygen. By the time they get to six liters, if you can't sustain your oxygen level in your blood, then they have to put you on a ventilator. And that ventilator is to try to give you oxygen because as Dr. Mason was mentioning, it's almost like you're drowning because the virus actually causes all this fluid to build up in your lungs so the oxygen can't get across. It can't get to your blood. And as a result, they have to put you in a ventilator to increase the pressure so that they force that oxygen across that barrier so that your blood picks up the oxygen. All right. Those of you who are listening, yeah. before you pick up any of that bad news, remember the good news that he yeah. said. And like Barbara Puckett mm -hmm. told me today, yes. I'm the most optimistic person she knows. And I want you to know that we are people of faith. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the optimism and the faith. 80% mm -hmm. of all the people mm -hmm. who get this virus, nothing happens to them. Yes. They are fine. They live through the virus. So even though there is a virus in our land, 80% of the people who, who got it and 80% of the people who will get it, nothing is going to happen. It is only 20% of the people that something, something happens. And then of that 20%, all 20% don't die. That's right. It's still a smaller percentage of the 20% of the people who actually die. So breathe. Take a breath. You're going to be all right. You're going to be just fine. Dr. Mason, somebody wants to know that in addition to eating healthy and exercising daily, what are some vitamins and minerals that we can take to strengthen our immune system? Well, the things that I talk about in terms of strengthening the immune system, number one is we got to sleep. You know, we forget about the power of getting rest. Number two, we got to manage our stress because stressors are also things that have a negative impact on our immune system. And number three, what we have to do is I'm not a big fan of pill supplements. Nobody made a better delivery system than God. And so the vitamins and nutrients that we need are in the foods. The vitamin C is in our citrus fruit, fruits, you know, oranges, apples, all of those. Sort, and, and the antioxidants are in all our deeply colored fruits, blueberries, blackberries. So we need to do that. That's far better. And it doesn't, you know, in the residues of whatever they use to make the pill to put this stuff in there. And you get the added benefit of the fiber that helps you have good bowel movements. All right. So you heard that. I yes. hope you go back and rewind it. Now, there is a theory going around that the 5G towers are causing this disease. Can, can, can any of you ex briefly explain why people think the 5G towers are causing it and Answer, is it causing it? Uh, I think it's totally uh, a myth. Uh, they actually, blow, they, I've heard of stories where they were uh, burning down 5G towers over in Europe, and uh, people were trying to get away from because they felt that the waves from the 5G towers were um, affecting them, and that this was actually what was causing the disease and not a virus. Um, and these are the myths. So that's why you have to really listen to people who have um, you know, some expertise in this, that have been studying this for decades and know uh, exactly what they're looking at. Um, so you have to go to the experts on this. So that what you don't want to do is listen to something like we were talking about before, where you have uh, someone saying that we can actually put uh, sunlight into your body and we can, uh, you know, give you some s uh, chemical solutions to, to uh, wash. And the first thing that came to my mind when I started thinking about all those things, it was like, you know, this is what Hitler was talking about, the final solution. Yes. <laughs> so they're talking about putting solutions into your body. Uh, so I, I, I really think that uh, those things are missed. They have to be totally uh, disregarded. Uh, they're people who are unscientific. They have no background in fact. And they are, uh, pa you know, perpetuating myths. Uh, we've heard too many myths uh, over the last four years, and we need to stop having those myths come out and those lies. You guys are wonderful, and you are staying with us. I appreciate that so much. We only have about 10 more minutes to go. Those of you with your questions, as you can see, we're trying to get in as many of them as we can. My concern also is that we continue to say uh, every year 
that the African American community, we don't have stores, we, we're not eating properly, uh, it's in our diet, it's in our, what, what can we do? Is it churches that must come together? Is it civil rights organizations that must come together? If we know that we have a low life expectancy rate, what, what can be done? Are there doctors, African-American doctors, that are all working together to increase the life expectancy rate of African-American people? What can be done? Well, you know, I, th I think it's all above what you said, but I think what the churches need to bring in is someone like Dr. Mason. Uh, he has been an advocate for, you know, being a vegan for many years and um, is on the right path. You know, he's looking at food as medicine. You need to make sure that there's a platform provided for people who are in these medical professions, cardiologists talking about high blood pressure. You need to have, bring in people who have, a, you know, have a real background. I think God made us to serve a purpose. And if that purpose is to help other human beings, uh, you know, on a spiritual level, that's the highest level of being a doctor. That's what I always say. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, if you have people who are able to look at the physical and mental health of the people who are in the community and correct those underlying things, those issues, and then talk about restructuring the infrastructure. We're coming out of this thing. We need to come out of this thing differently. You know, because every day we have, I, I drove to Chicago State University to give a talk one time, and I heard this popping sound, so everyone slowed down in the traffic, and then we sped up again, got ready to go. I got to the school, opened my trunk of my car, and there was a bullet hole through it. And there was a nine millimeter slug sitting in the trunk. I still have the bullet hole in my car right now, in the trunk. So what, what I look at is that there are people dying from other things every day in our community, like Dr. Mason was mentioning. And we need to come out of this thing saying that we don't want anything to be causing us to die. Not just coronavirus, but not getting a flu shot. One of the major things you can do to protect yourself right now is to get a flu shot. And people are asking, why is that? Because in the fall, if we do have a second wave, you do not want to be going into a hospital in a medical practice with the flu in order to be getting the coronavirus because that's where everyone is to be going. You, you hear can that? get both. You hear that? You better get the flu shot now because he's saying that when the second wave comes, you'll have to go into a hospital or somewhere to get a flu shot, and you don't even want to be nowhere near it. So right. get the flu shot. Now. And you can get yeah. both at the same time. And then, both what? You could get the flu shot and? No, you can get you get the flu shot, but if you don't get the flu you shot. You can get the flu and corona at the same time. No, no. If you get the flu shot, then uh, you're protected against the flu. If you don't, you can develop the flu, the regular flu, and go into a healthcare facility, and someone sitting next to you has the corona oh. virus, and then you get that one too. Also, if you do that, you'll stop the uh, the surge on the healthcare system that could happen in the fall, and you will save on personal protective equipment. You'll save supplies for people who really need it. So yeah. get the flu shot. Only 45% of the people in this country get the flu shot every year. People die from the flu every year. 40,000 people. 40,000 yes. people die from regular of, flu. of the flu regular every flu. year. Yeah. One every million year. hospitalizations from the regular flu. But the other thing, to get to your question about what you were asking about the churches, uh, we have got to begin to think about, I'm not saying we're the only people, as you said earlier, that eat fried chicken or eat it. No, we're not. And we're not the only people. But our food supply is so engineered today that you don't really know what you're eating. Our chickens, the biggest place of antibiotic resistance now is coming from our the food that we're eating because we're giving hormones to the chickens. Now our girls are having their periods at nine years old. We're seeing hormones being given to cows. We're being, we're, the, 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 the pesticides that are being used, the genetic modification of these seeds that allow them to be more hardy. These are things that, most major religious organizations have their own food. That's why the Amish grow their own food. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of other organizations grow their own food. We have to begin to grow our own food because until we do, we don't know what we're eating. And then we need to teach our children the age-old art of cooking. Because right now, and I get it, people are pressured, they're in a hurry, 
And what we get too much of our food cooked outside of our houses. Almost 75% of the food that a lot of us are consuming today is cooked outside your house mm -hmm. in a fast food joint or something like that. In the days when I was growing up, I wanted 10 kids, grew up in Inglewood. My mom always had a pot, pot of beans on the stove mm -hmm. and some cornbread. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we, we need to go back to some of those as you had one Sunday when you had the old ladies, the light ladies choir come out and they went back to the old time way. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's what we need to do. And we did a study at Trinity with Reverend Moss looking at if we change, we biochemically measured the impact that it had on the, the physiology, how our bodies worked. It works. Food, the right food works. Genesis 129 was not wrong, mm -hmm. you know. So we need to go back to do some very basic things. We don't need nothing fancy, but we do need to have our children learn to cook and eat more of the food they cook themselves and less of the stuff they get from somebody else. Is there a website where people can follow you and find out good meal preparation and uh, healthy eating? Do you have a website? Well, not yet, but right. I'm coming out with one that I'm working. Actually, I just met with uh, the first ladies, All right. and we're going to be working because that's the real wealth of our community is our health, mm -hmm. and we don't have any wealth without health, and we got to bring our businesses back in our community. Dr. Damon Arnold, we're getting ready to go off in a little while. Would you use your closing remarks to tell us anything that we need to know about this next month that's ahead of us and how to make it through it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I was mentioning the flu shot. It's coming up in August. Get it in August. Don't wait till uh, September, October, November. Get it in August. It's not too early. Get the flu shot in August. And then the other thing is that when you get home, leave your shoes at the door, wash your hands. And what they don't say in the CDC, and they haven't been saying in the media, is wash your hands, wash your face, and then wash your hands again. And the reason is that you touch all kinds of surfaces outside. Mm -hmm. We touch our face, and the study that was done, average person touches their I face 23 hand. times an hour. Ooh. 23 times an hour. So you're taking stuff off the surface, put it on your face. So later on, you wash your hands, and you think you're doing a good thing. Then you touch your face and wipe, wipe your eye, and you rub your nose, and you rub your mouth. And that stuff that's on your face can be uh, taken into your body. I'm going to fold my so, arms. Yes. So making sure, and if you have a, a baby, you know, the babies like to touch people's faces. So they, they'll, take, they'll take it into their body too. So make sure you wash your hands, wash your face, and then wash your hands again. I have a t tendency to take vitamin C, no special medical thing behind it, but I take about 2,000 milligrams a day. Um, also, what I do is um, I use something like Listerine when I first get home, rinse my mouth out and wash it out, and then blow my nose, throw the tissue in the toilet, and flush it away. Wow. So that's the thing, that just to wash yourself, make sure you're keeping yourself uh, clean. Don't forget to hit the share button. Don't forget to share this tonight. Dr. Mason, do you have some instructions mm -hmm. with us as we're on our way off? No, just eat better. Drink water, mm -hmm. eat fruits, eat vegetables. That's what we need to do. It'll all help. I want you all to know that I hope that tonight's uh, Faith in Crisis has brought you much faith and that you remember that we walk by faith and not by sight. I think that of all the things that we heard tonight, uh, we've heard some great medical advice, but I think that when Dr. Damon Arnold reminded us that 80% of the people who contract this virus, 80% of us don't die, we get well, we recover, of the 20%, some go on to have medical problems, some have died, but it's not everybody. So please don't look at this virus as a death sentence or like you're on your way to the cemetery because you're not. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And remember that you have to speak affirmations and you have to remind yourself that I'm his child and by his stripes I am healed. And you have to remind yourself that God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to Faith in Crisis. Remember to do something good for somebody else. If this virus hasn't taught us anything, it has taught us how connected we are in America to one another. We all need each other. Somebody needs you. Be there for somebody else. God bless you. God keep you. Facebook, we love you. And thank you so much for all your comments tonight. Good night.
All right, but only only we can see him. They they gonna see him on TV. All right, okay. Well, that was good. I was wondering what happened. Thank you so much. Man, thank, thank you. y'all. Thank you. thank you all so much. This is so important to do. Yeah. We had over 700 people at one time on Facebook, but you know our biggest audience for this thing is TV, and you know everybody's watching on TV. President, when he told the, when he told the government.